Well, many students are struggling in academics after the pandemic. Studies show they experienced learning delays and regressions over the past few years. Now parents are trying to figure out how to best support their students, both socially and academically. And joining me right now is Dr. Shay Fedigan, co-director of the Pediatric Anxiety and Traumatic Life Stress Clinic at Stanford Medicine. So doctor, thanks for joining us. Now that students are back in school, are we seeing more kids develop social or illness anxiety as they try to readjust to a more pre-pandemic pre normal? Well, thank you for having me, Ryan. Um, you know, we're all readjusting. So it's expected that, you know, with any adjustment, there's going to be some transitory anxiety. Anxiety in and of itself isn't a concerning emotion. We all have it. It's important. Um, so seeing an increase in some anxiety is what we would expect for kids. It's more the problematic levels of anxiety. Um, and research is suggesting that there may be, there is an increase in pediatric anxiety um, since the onset of the pandemic. And here at Stanford Children's um, Health, in our pediatric anxiety and traumatic life stress clinic, there are a number of families who are seeking care with us that have cited the pandemic and transition back to school as a prompting event for worsening anxiety or obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, Children are just more vulnerable to problematic levels of anxiety. Those children who are, these major changes have made them a little bit more susceptible to experiencing problematic levels of anxiety. Um, they just didn't have the same opportunities to face their fears, feel that distress and discomfort, and do things anyways um, in the last several years. And this is a muscle, that bravery muscle, that needs to be moved and developed. And so we are seeing some more increase. And are we talking about younger children or older children? What, what, what age group are we looking at? Really across the age ranges. Um, so both school age children who are transitioning into school, as well as older teens and adolescents and transitional age youth. Um, we're really seeing it across the board. And, and what are some signs of anxiety or depression that parents can actually look out for? Yeah. So this really can vary depending on age range, but like three major signs we tend to say to monitor are, are you seeing increased for anxiety? Are you seeing increased avoidance, increased reassurance seeking, um, and increased like physical complaints? Um, with avoidance, avoidance is a hallmark behavior in response to anxiety, adults and kids alike. Um, so is your child consistently avoiding situations that are in an effort to try to avoid or escape the uncomfortable fear or worry, whether that's thoughts like, I can't do this, this is too hard, they're gonna make fun of me, or whether it's physical feelings. For reassurance seeking, is there a pattern um, of trying to confirm certainty of either you know, their performance, the situation, are things okay? With problematic levels of anxiety, we see excessive reassurance seeking, where no matter how much a parent, a peer, um, give a child, they keep searching for more to kind of make that anxiety go away. And lastly, regarding those physiological concerns, we do tend to see this um, even more particularly true for younger children and school age kids, but they may consistently complain of headaches, stomach aches, nausea, just feeling weird sometimes in their body with no underlying medical cause. So meaning a physician wouldn't say it's due to an illness, but I want to highlight your child's not making this up. The mind and body are connected, and so they really are experiencing these physical symptoms. The underlying reason may just actually be fear and worry. And naturally, kids, humans alike, we want to get rid of things that are causing us distress. Um, so those are things that you may be looking for. Again, across all of these, none of them are alone indicative of problematic levels of anxiety. We're really looking for, are these behaviors isolated, or do they continue to grow? Like, for instance, being fearful of one Spanish final um, exam, you know, and reporting they're sick or they don't want to go, not problematic. But if you're seeing consistently across whenever they're taking tests and quizzes, they're reporting they're feeling ill, they're terrified, they can't do it, they're trying to escape or avoid it, that's when you might start to notice, okay, I think something's going on here. So how, how can parents help, like, kids get back into like, extracurricular activities, get involved, and, and why are those so important for the development? Yeah. So I think one of the main pieces that we want to highlight is doing it gradually. You know, one, we don't typically teach a kid to swim by throwing in the deep end. 
we want to try to have them start in the shallow end, get used to it, build their confidence, get comfortable, and then move their way up. Maybe your kids swam in the deep end. You know, they did tons of extracurriculars before the pandemic, but they've been sidelined for a while. Maybe they're now used to floaties, kind of some of these adjustments. It's going to take them a little bit of time to transition. So kind of knowing doing it in a gradual progression and allowing them time will be really helpful. Yeah, so slow and steady. That's some good advice there. So Dr. Shea Fennigan with Stanford Medicine, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Ryan. And if it's you or someone you know is in a crisis, you can always reach out to help from the, get help from the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline by calling or texting 988. And to hear from more young people about their struggles with mental health, we're bringing you a powerful documentary tonight. You can watch it streaming on CBS News Bay Area starting at 7.30 p.m.